Hello everyone. How would you like to learn how to attack when the kings are castled on opposite sides? I'm Grandmaster Max Sillingworth, and in this video, that's just what we'll learn. How to attack their castled king with a little technique that I like to call the hook. And I'll explain a bit more about the hook when we get there. But first, let's uh, see what your thoughts would be on this position. What move would you play here if you're in black shoes? As always with my videos, you can pause the video to have more time to think about the position and come up with the best move you possibly can. Okay, let's talk about the position then. So, the things that come to mind to me automatically from this position is, well, the kings are cast on opposite sides, uh, also, you could add that the bishops are opposite colours, meaning that the side that can take the initiative, that can take control of the game, will have a very serious advantage. And the thing I automatically think of that both sides are aiming for is to open up a file to the opponent's king. And the way we do that is by charging our pawns forward and creating some pawn exchanges to open up the files. So that would typically involve for white you know, playing moves like this to push the pawns forward in a direction of black's king to try and get the rook and queen into the action. And what do you think the equivalent version of the plan for black would be? Yeah, that's right. Our plan would be to go for g5 and g4 using the hook on h3 to try and open up the g file to black's king. And we'll see that black uses this plan in the game almost to perfection. In fact, I think only this position was one where black didn't perhaps play it in the, in the best way, or in one of the best ways. Because here he played the move of h6, which I think might be a little bit careless, in that the move h6 itself only has the idea of preparing g5. Whereas if you had played a move like rook g8 instead, well, it's just a much more effective way of preparing the g5 break. Because after, say, b4 and g5, I mean, white's not in a position where he's going to take on g5, because that would simply open up the g file for the uh, rook on g8. So after knight g5, you can even... I was going to say that h6 looks pretty good and going for some tactics on the h3 pawn. But maybe knight d4 is even better, just to destroy the center and create all sorts of nasty threats in this position. It's clear black has taken over the game by actually focusing on the center in a way by attacking the king side uh, as we lured the knight away from defending d4. So it is true that white could play a move like g4 and try and block up the attack. But then black actually has a really clever move in this position, which is very hard to find, but it turns out that actually knight e7, double exclamation mark, is a really great move. With the point that basically if white takes the bishop, we can go g4 and get a very big attack against the white king. Uh, if takes then you know, rook g4 and if the king runs to f1 then, well black can play queen a6 and we can see that you know, white is just coming under a massive attack after rook f5, where the knight is under fire, and if knight e5 then, well, probably the simplest is just rook h4, and you know, white doesn't have a way out of rook h1, uh, removing the defender of the, the e2 rook, and if he tries to move the king then, either rook h1 comes anyway, or the rook on e2 will be taken. Okay, this is a bit of a computer line, but a very beautiful one all the same. And here we see the key lesson in this rook g8 line that sometimes you actually can ignore the opponent's supposed threat and just go ahead with an attacking move anyway. It's definitely a good starting point in our calculations to see if we can just keep control of the game regardless and ignore their idea in favor of our own threats. So black played h6 in the game. And here I think white played a little bit too passively because he played this move of b3, which 
I think somehow misses the urgency in the position. You know, the king's on opposite sides. This really is an attacking race of who can attack faster. And so I think that b4 would be much more to the point. So that if black were to play a move like g5, well then white can go bishop b2 and go for a quick c4 to kick the rook away. Say g4 and even c4 here. Just again ignoring the threat and going for our own threat. And if black were to retreat with rook d to d8, then, you know, even a move like d5 could be quite strong, hitting the knight and hitting the rook. So we can see here that white is playing a lot more aggressively than what we'll see in the game. And this is, I the only way that white can really hope to uh, avoid coming under such a strong black attack by making sure his attack comes first. But instead, white played a quiet move b3. Uh, black met this with g5. And now after bishop b2, white is going for a similar sort of idea. But it's a lot less effective with the pawn on b3 compared to the pawn on b4. I don't think it's a big surprise what move black played here. But if you need a hint, it uses the concept of the hook. Okay, so the move black played here is g4. The reason we call it a hook is that basically this pawn has moved forward. And we're using that fact to open up the files on the king side faster than if that pawn was back on h2, let's say. So the fact that the knight and the pawn are under attack means that white doesn't really have a way to avoid the opening of the king side. Uh, also here, white, I think, maybe didn't play it in the best way because he played the move h takes g4, so allowing after bishop g4 for black to attack this knight and essentially allow black to take control of the game. I think that white had to be a lot more aggressive and I think again it was probably time to ignore the threat with a move like c4 in this position and then if the rook were to retreat then only then to play a move h takes g4 and this way white would basically avoid the problems with the rook swinging over along the fifth rank that we would see in the game. And I think after queen c3 and say rook g8 that you know, all three results are still possible here. Black certainly has a nice combination of play down the g file and pressure against the d4 pawn. But the game certainly goes on after rook a d1. And yeah, I'd say there are chances for both sides from this position. So instead of that though, white played the move h takes g4. And after bishop g4, his idea was to play queen to f4. But then black found a very good reply to keep his advantage. Uh, do you see the move that black played at this point? Okay, there are a few moves that are quite appealing. And you know, actually even a move like bishop h5 is somewhat tempting to keep our strong bishop. And keep the tension in the position. But the move that Zemaidianos played is also pretty strong. We have our bishop takes f3, rook f3, and then rook f5. Uh, obviously knight d4 would not win a pawn because the f7 pawn is hanging at the end. So with rook f5 we defend the pawn while attacking the queen to keep control of the game. Uh, the game saw queen e3. Admittedly, white didn't defend in the best way, but it's a nice example for showing how the attack down the g-file can typically play out. Uh, maybe d3 was a better square for the queen in hindsight, so that the rook could maybe come to the third rank for a defense. To add rook to g8, uh, both putting the rook on the half-open file and avoiding any d5 discovered attacks. After rook 8 d1, black played rook f to g5 in this position and after white's move g3 well then a little weakness has been created in the g3 pawn and how do you think black improved his position and exploited the new weakness created in white's camp around the king okay there are two moves i think that are really good here one is to go h5 and use the pawn again as a battering ram to open up the white king even more. 
And the one that Black played is, I think, at least as good. Uh, and that is the move knight to e7. With similar ideas, but using the knight instead of the rook as the battering ram to break down the white king's protection. Uh, seeing this idea, white played rook d3 to try to meet, I guess, knight f5 with some queen move to try and get out of this. Uh, say if knight f5, maybe even queen e5 might be possible actually. It sort of looks suicidal at first to put the queen in range of all sorts of discovered attacks. But it turns out knight g3 is actually a blunder because of rook takes g3. And if uh, rook e5 we can see white's idea that he can take the rook with check and then have uh, you know a big material advantage for the queen in this case. So white's trying to be a bit tricky in the defense. But uh, black saw that and played h5 instead, uh, lending some support to the move h4. Uh, to this point that white made his decisive mistake. For the more advanced viewers, I would suggest pausing the video here and thinking for at least five minutes to see if you can come up with the best defense for white. Uh, of course, a tough puzzle since even the nearly 2600 GM crafts tip didn't uh, find the best move in the game. So, in the game, White played the move King F1, which we will get to in a moment. It certainly looks natural to get out of this pin on the H file, but it has some other tactical problems, as we will see. Uh, I think the move White had to play here was probably the move Queen F3, which, yeah, it looks very risky, but up to H4 you can... I think play queen f7 and with the attack on e6 and e7 after that, I think white can actually survive the attack. So I guess black would maybe play knight f5 and you know, still have quite good attacking chances. But white can at least play bishop c1 and well with the threat against the rook, white is suddenly mounting a defense. And after say rook g4 and rook e4, yeah I think white is probably holding even though his position remains worse. At least for the moment, the first wave of the attack has been repelled. But instead, white played king f1. And that leads to some problems. Actually, even the direct h4 is pretty strong here. But uh, the move black played was even better. He played knight f5 first, activating the knight with a tempo. Uh, white played queen to f3, which... Probably wasn't the best move, but even after a move like queen e4, I think that even h4 is pretty strong here, where it's not even really a pawn sack, because after gh4 you have moves like rook g4 to fork the queen and the pawn, after say queen h1 and rook h4. I mean at this point it's fairly clear that you know, white's king is very exposed. The knight is way better than the bishop. And black certainly has a very big advantage here. In fact, maybe we can even improve black's play. Where maybe knight h4 is, is even better again. With ideas of perhaps trying to get the knight to f4. And you know, just get to this monster outpost. Uh, from which it dominates the white king. So, it's going to take time. But I do sense it's probably winning for black with best play. Uh, well... The move Queen F3 did make Black's task a lot easier. Uh, do you see how Black just wins material by force here? Yeah, it's not a super tough tactic, but I'm sure if you didn't see it right away, you paused the video and you know, made sure you saw it in the end. So the answer is Knight takes G3. I mean, it's a check and a capture. So if you're looking for a tactic, it's the first move you probably think of. After F, G3 and Rook F5. Black won the queen, and I'll show the remaining moves just for completion's sake. So takes, takes, rook e2, and you know, f4 just to you know, rip open the white king and open file for the rook. gf4, queen g6. I mean, after king e1, queen g1, king d2, and rook g2. It's not even just the material advantage, but... Also, this past H pawn is very hard for white to stop with being an outside pass pawn. 
After rook d3, rook e2, king h e2, and h4. White resigned as there's just no good way to stop the h pawn uh, from this position. So yeah, that was uh, my little game I want to show you on how to attack with kings on opposite flanks. So what did you learn from this game? Let me know in the comments. If you're a particularly ambitious chess improver, let me know what is one thing you're going to do differently after watching this video. Because that's where the biggest improvement comes. So make sure to show your appreciation for this video. If you enjoyed this mini lesson, leave a like. I uh, even consider subscribing so you can enjoy more of these Grandmaster lessons as I uh, share them. And in the meantime, best of luck with your chess, chess improver. I will see you in the next video.